that the stakeholders were involved with it from the beginning. It was a bunch of people saying, how do we increase our carbon capture within our land management? They just wanted to know. They didn't start out with a theory. They just said, how can we do this? We think we can do it, and how can we do it? So what I'm going to talk about today is some of the basic findings of it, and then a little bit about compost, and maybe hopefully promote some ideas of where you all can come in, because these folks are managers of rural lands, and as far as I can tell, you all are managers of urban and suburban lands, and maybe sometimes rural lands also. So in, in some way, you're similar to this group of people, and that you're stewards of the lands that you're taking care of in one way or another. <clears throat> so this is the mission of the Marin Carbon Project, and basically to enhance carbon sequestration, rangeland, agricultural land, forest soils, through applied research, demonstration, and implementation. Now, when Chris says this has implications for the world, I certainly thought it did. I left a 10-year career in climate policy to go work for these folks because I think it's the most exciting thing I've seen in 10 years. This is one of the city's climate goals that I was really lucky to work on as my last project, 0, 50, 100 routes, zero waste, 50% sustainable transportation, 100% renewable energy, and roots, and that's the city's climate plan. So we're gonna talk about the roots portion of this today, which is the ability of plants, uh, nature's living technology, to capture uh, carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it in the soil. So this is the part where, bear with me if I'm boring you, but it's really good, for, at least for a lot of folks who are not scientists, don't work with plants to understand. When plants breathe, they put out oxygen and moisture, right? And they breathe in CO2, right, during the right time of day. And under the energy of the sun and with water from the soil, then minerals from the soil, they build sugars. And those sugars are carbohydrates. So one of the things that I hope that you come away with today is this information, which is all the carbon in carbohydrates comes from the air and nowhere else. So everything that we're wearing that's not synthetic or plastic-based is based in carbohydrates. What we eat, all based in carbohydrates. Uh, materials that we build, a lot of our buildings and tables and furniture, all carbohydrates. So the premise of the Marin Carbon Project is that anything that we eat, build, or you know, live with, clothing, can be made in a way that's climate beneficial because you're pulling in carbon from the air to make carbohydrates. If you do that in the right way, we can have an entire system that helps us balance the climate. So the Marine Carbon Project looked at how to test the mechanism of photosynthetic carbon transfer um, into soils without the emissions associated with manure. And I'll back up and say when they first did their preliminary projects, they looked at soil carbon in marine rangelands, and they found a really big difference. Some rangelands had like 15 tons per hectare of total soil carbon, and some had 100. It's a really big difference. And they looked at, well, was there a difference in the grazing management? Well, there was a difference in grazing <coughs> management, but it didn't correlate to soil carbon. So they looked, they asked the farmers a bunch of questions, and it turns out the thing that was the indicator for the rangelands that had high soil carbon was if there had been manure historically applied. So those farmers, maybe sometime in the last 80 to five years, had land applied manure on their rangelands. So that was interesting because they had thought that it would be about grazing management. Turns out it's more about amendments of an organic um, uh, carbon onto the soil. So they wanted to test this theory without using manure because manure has a lot of emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. It also has negative water quality benefit issues and chemical fertilizer, same thing issues with water quality and issues with um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So they used compost. And um, to mimic this theory that the application of an organic amendment increased soil carbon, they put a half an inch of compost out on rangeland. And we'll get to that in a second. So um, I don't know why. I put this slide in here just because people often ask, well, what do you mean by compost? I don't mean mulch. I don't mean uh, green waste or something you would get out of the green bin and chop up and put out there. Uh, in this case, we're referring to organic products that have gone through the biodegradation process, have gone through th a thermophilic phase of composting, which means they've reached a high temperature over a certain period of time. And 
they've been completely decomposed, which kills all pathogens that may be present in that waste. So here's just a quick slide of what I mean by thermophilic. It's where those little microorganisms, the heat-loving ones, start eating everything in the soil <coughs> it heats up. And then that heat eventually kills off all the other unbeneficial organisms. And at the end, you're left with more of a stable new product uh, that we call compost. So as, again, please forgive me if you already know this, compost is a ratio of carbon and nitrogen. Um, and so that means you need the brown stuff and you need the green stuff. And this slide I put in there just because I'm sure you guys know this, but the California Water Board didn't know this. I spent the entire summer last year educating them on the difference between organic nitrogen and inorganic nitrogen, water-soluble nitrogen and stable nitrogen. And compost has nitrogen in it, but it's stable. It's not going to run off into your water table. It's just going to be released to the soil slowly over time. And that's a really big difference when you're talking about you know, getting nitrogen the right amount into your soils for plant growth um, in a way that's not going to interfere with uh, your water table or runoff into local riparian systems. So again, um, you may know this, but the water board did not know this. So we're going to get back to the project. So they spread a half an inch of compost. This is what it looks like in the spreading. That's John Wick driving the tractor. It looks like a dusting. They basically just dusted the ground with compost. Um, this is one of, I think, six uh, experiment sites. And they, they <coughs> tested a couple different methods. There's the control plot. You can see the composted plot. There was a plot they plowed using the key line plow, which had a lot of claims about soil carbon increases. And then they plowed and composted. And they tested these six plots, um, six plots, <laughs> blocks of plots. Um, for, for five years. And the interesting thing is in the first year they didn't really see anything. But in the second year they saw something that the cows already knew about. So that's, remember this right here? So where are those cows? The cows naturally selected the plots that had been, had compost applied. And it turns out that that's because the plants that grew from that had a higher um, volume of protein and the forage production was much greater on those plots. And those, that was later scientifically tested uh, with UC Berkeley, who is the science lead on this project. So we did all this testing, and really the cows know best is my moral of the story. Um, this is some more scientific graphs, but this is telling us what the cows knew, that plant production increased every year following a one-time compost application. So this is 2012 data. We have data through 2015, and it shows even during the drought, that these plots had an increase in forage production compared to the other plots. So there's that. And then the other thing that was really interesting is that um, it turns out that the control plots, the blue over there, were actually losing carbon. And that the plots that had compost applied gained carbon, not the first year, they didn't see anything, but the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and the fifth year. And we think that you didn't see anything the first year because it was essentially stabilizing what's a loss in the system. And right now, from the literature review that we've done, it looks like most rangelands worldwide, most grasslands are losing carbon because of climate change, because of erosion, because of overgrazing. Those systems are kind of what we call crashing from a carbon perspective. So the compost not only uh, increased carbon, it arrested the loss of the carbon in that system. Um, this is just a, more of the same thing. It's just showing the uh, increase in carbon in composted plots versus control. Now, it is a water-constrained system. In years where we didn't get any water, there was very little gain. Uh, however, we did see still gain over uh, the control plots, which had none. And um, increase in retaining soil moisture, which was really important in those drought years. So this is another piece of science that I think it's important to understand because it's one thing that the carbon project found out and it's why it's so important and potentially so powerful. So soil carbon comes in a couple different fractions and, and we'll, for this case we'll call them a temporary fraction, some, some place where it stays in the soil for decades and some place where it stays in the soil for a century or millennia. So we call that the permanent fraction. Um, most soil carbon, and this is what we knew before, is labile, it turns over very quickly, right? It comes in through photosynthesis in the roots and then it gets eaten by microorganisms that die and it decays back out through the system. So that's mostly what we think of 
uh, when we thought of soil carbon previous to this study. Now what, what this <coughs> found was that those graphs that I showed you earlier were net carbon gain in these two other pools, the occluded light fraction and the heavy fraction. So this, this is new science. So we didn't understand before that carbon could move to these more permanent pools so quickly, but it moved within a year into these more permanent fractions, which means that it's not just coming into the soil and turning over in a biogenic cycle, it's actually coming in and staying. So that really changed the way scientists are thinking now about soils as a carbon sink, not just as a place to cycle carbon, but as a place to store carbon. This is a really pretty picture that I hope to paint sometime, <laughs> but let me describe it. So working with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service and La Colorado State University, which keeps the big models that the USDA uses around soils and lands, they grafted this response and they said, okay, let's put this new information that we know into the model and see what happens. And this line that looks like the ski slope that starts on the top left and comes down, that's carbon that was added from the compost. So people are like, yeah, of course you get more carbon in the soil when you put compost in it because there's carbon in your compost. Well, that's really true. So that carbon goes into the soil and then over time you can see it goes away in terms of its permanence. Now what you see on the bottom is the soil's response to the addition of that carbon. So that's the <coughs> photosynthetic increase of carbon in the soil and that lasts for predicted up to 100 years. So we have data for five years but the models think that that one-time increase in uh, plant health and productivity that the compost brought will increase carbon storage and capture for 100 years out into the future, provided that land is not plowed, um, provided that it, you know, it doesn't, we just doesn't turn into a giant desert. So you know, we have to keep, doesn't, you know, can't plow it and keep the carbon, right? But if you keep it in an intact, healthy uh, system where the soil is covered, that's probably <coughs> what you should get. Um, so one thing that people say now is, oh, Marine Carbon Project's just about compost. It's not just about compost. It's really about how you maximize soil carbon and the different uh, practices that you can use to do that. So working with the USDA, uh, there's, we have a new model out. It's called COMET, C-O-M-E-T. And it looks at 34 practices that rangeland managers can do to enhance soil carbon capture in their systems. This is just a, a bar um, line chart of a couple different of those practices, practices that are estimated for a Marin farm that was one of our carbon farm projects. And it says, you know, improve your pasture management, restore riparian areas, uh, digest your manure, put compost on your rangeland, and agroforestry, so plant trees, windbreaks, riparian buffers. Uh, and this is sort of the carbon benefit from one hectare uh, over 20 years. So what this project did was it allowed the folks who were part of the Marin Carbon Project to say, wow, what if instead of managing just for annual yield, we managed for carbon in the soil knowing that managing for carbon is going to manage for yield in the long run. So then they started looking at all these other practices. Um, let's see if I can... This is something you guys know. This is soil that's degraded without carbon on the left, and then uh, soil that's had carbon restored um, on the right. So you see increased water holding capacity, increased aeration, filtration, um, and increased nutrient uptake in the plant community. And really what you're talking about, I think in the most basic form is you're feeding the soil, right? So that carbon and nitrogen is food for the microbial life that lives in the soil. And by feeding the system, and since soil is the base of that whole system, the whole thing becomes more productive, more resilient, and healthier. So this is, again, I just put this in here because, again, it's not just about compost. You have to keep the soil covered, um, disturb it as little as possible. And again, we're talking about our research, which was done in grassland systems. You guys are in systems that are much more uh, touched. They probably turn over more. Um, but these are some of the important principles uh, for keeping carbon in the ground. Um, there's hey, hey, some. Kel, I'm yeah. sorry. Huh? Um, maybe I missed it, but how you had a treatment that was both plowing and compost. How did that tr come out? Yeah, um, so the plowing and compost one, um, we saw uh, an, a, a plant growth response, um, but overall. Uh, the soil carbon was a net, it was a net I think it was like a balance in the end. 
because we put carbon in, but then by plowing the soil, you're breaking it, which makes it available, which increases plant growth. But you're also, that carbon is respiring to the air. So we did not see a net carbon benefit. So from that's the, the number plowing. two, basically. Right, so yeah. exactly. So disturb the soil as little possible, don't plow it. Um, we have some systems now, like Pie Ranch down in um, Pescadero is looking at you know, <coughs> doing a no-till system for four years and cover crops and grasses, and then going in and tilling it and using it for vegetable production for two, and then putting it back in a more root-covered system for four so that they can try to get an overall net gain while still using that in a conventional sense to grow the type of crops that they grow in that system. So there's lots of different systems. Keep in mind this research was done specifically for rangeland and now we're in the process of looking at how it can be applied in other systems. Um, okay, so the main, the main thing in this is really trying to change the way we think about managing for natural systems um, as managing for carbon because carbon is the keystone in that system uh, because water follows carbon. And because when you have carbon and water in productivity in your soil, from a biological perspective, you also have enhanced um, uh, nutrient availability and you have better management of your nitrogen cycle as well. So instead of thinking about managing for plant growth, we're thinking about managing for carbon under the soil, which then inherently helps manage for plant health and growth. Uh, in the long run, or maybe even say in the medium run, but maybe not in the immediate short run in the same way you see from a petrochemical fertilizer that just bumps it uh, and you're seeing a lot of above ground growth in the plant and not a lot of root growth in the plant. So what the work of the Marin Carbon <coughs> Project is now trying to do is to work with land stewards to kind of rethink the way that they manage land into managing for carbon in the soil. Um, We've been really successful with this. Uh, the governor this year, last year, uh, added uh, a new pillar to his climate ch change strategy. So now he has five pillars instead of four. And that fifth pillar is working lands. Um, and uh, he's been very supportive, as has most of the state agencies and federal agencies of this um, information. So we're now really starting to look at land as a way uh, to draw down existing atmospheric carbon. And uh, the work with the RCDs is also going ahead. We have 17 RCDs that are now rolling out carbon farm plan training in their districts. And uh, we hope to have funding through the Healthy Soils Initiative uh, that we've also worked on with the state available for those projects this year. Um, this is a slide that my boss, John Wick, puts in his presentations. And it's really optimistic, and I kind of like it. Um, but he's basically saying, this is new information. And if we can organize around it, we can live a life that we live now, but that's going to be productive, balanced for the planet, and good for our health. And one where we spend more time focusing on managing for abundance and less time focusing on managing for uh, diseases, pests, and other issues that arise in a short view system. Um, so he's really thinking about that. Everything that we wear, that we eat, that we make can be made in a climate beneficial way if we figure out how to manage our lands that way. So there's this question, which I was, Chris, I told I had no idea how to answer. Um, but this is what I found in the Bay Friendly Landscaping and nurture the soil seems to be one of the seven principles. So that's great and conserve water. We've gotten a lot of support from the water agencies just because the increase we're seeing in water holding capacity from managing lands in this way is so great. Um, so that's been really good. And then the other thing is, you know, where you guys go and what you do, uh, I, I don't know if you have clients or the lands that you work on, but we need a lot more compost, <laughs> essentially. And it's not going to all come from big facilities. There's not enough big facilities in the state right now. Yeah? What, what is the source of your compost? Yeah, so uh, it was uh, green waste and municipal waste, municipal food waste. Uh, it was OMRI certified, and there were was one compost that was used both in the Merida Headlands and the Sierra Foothills, where the other experiments were, because they bracketed the system. And I forget where it's from, but it was an organic certified, OMRI certified green waste and municipal food waste compost. 
Yeah. Did they? Um, did anyone do any calculations about total carbon costs, like transporting the compost, that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah. So there was two life cycle papers done by uh, the University of Berkeley and in conjunction with the Colorado State University, and they looked at the full life cycle emissions. I don't have those slides with me, but of trucking the compost, of creating the compost, right, because there's some emissions associated when you compost. Um, trucking that compost, applying the compost, and then the sequestration benefits over time compared to manure application or uh, petrochemical fertilizer. And uh, both the manure and the fer chemical fertilizer have a net increase in emissions, whereas the composting in every scenario except for one has a, a avoided emissions by a very large amount. And the one scenario where it doesn't is if you theoretically have a landfill that captures 90% of its greenhouse gas emissions and you have a drought for 10 years. <laughs> so basically it's a good practice. Um, taking those organics out of the landfill or out of land app where they're going to be emitting emissions, getting them into compost where those emissions are mitigated and then getting that compost on the ground where it turns on a carbon sink is a net benefit in every way that we've run it so far. Manure flow, manure compost, uh -huh. I think. So is the same true about that, like composting manure uh -huh. mitigating, as opposed to just applying Yes, manure. yes, absolutely. So I just to make that clear. So like yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So <laughs> manure compost is really good, and we are right now, you know, trying, we're talking to the dairy industry, like how do you compost your manure, and um, can we get it more composted? For the big... Uh, most of your methane comes off of the manure in the first two or three days that it's produced. So from a large scale perspective, you need to capture it and get it covered or into compost quickly. For the backyard operations or on-farm operations that are small to mid-scale, composting is still gonna be better than just putting it out on the land because when it's out on the land, it continues to biodegrade and release methane. It also can be a source of water contamination. Um, and, uh, versus if it's composted, you're going to see not the emissions, there's no emissions once it's out on the land and you're not gonna see the water quality issues associated with it. So yes, it's still good, but if you're really looking to maximize emissions capture, you gotta get that manure quickly into um, some system, yeah. I have a question, another, uh, is any uh, research about using uh, compost tea to do carbon sequestration? Yes, so we did, um, I, I wasn't there when they did this, but um, one of the, two of the test plots used compost tea, uh, and I think Elaine Ingham was the one who created that yeah. compost tea. And how do you compare with this? Uh, not very well. No? Um, okay. They saw a little bit of enhanced plant growth, but um, nothing that had the response that the compost did. So to the point where they just sort of stopped working with it and didn't test it further because it didn't look like it had something that was really of use. So it might improve the soil, but it doesn't work as a carbon sink. You know why we think, no, so this is now I'm entering into speculation, right? Yeah. Okay, so what I think, what we think is going on is that because those soils are so degraded, that that compost tea is not enough to get the carbon back to the point where it's gonna stop the loss, because it's bleeding, right? So you kind of have to stop that loss, and then it starts restoring itself. Um, if you look at biodynamic agriculture, you know, teas are used a lot, but they're also, if you read some of those lectures, um, they're, they're meant to be used for a healthy system, and they generally really feed the mycorrhizal fungi and all those other beneficial things that are only present once you have soil carbon levels that are a certain height, like certain amount, and at, and at this point, our rangelands are so degraded that we think that's why the compost tea didn't really show up as a big indicator because it wasn't enough to actually restore the soil carbon levels that we need. So maybe future chances to, to do that, the first step, and then research like yeah. after the, it's more mitigated. Right, so. right. So this, the compost really was like, it was like a big dose of medicine. Yeah. And because these systems were really sick from a perspective of not having carbon. In them, yeah. Question? Yeah. Um, are there any? Did anyone crunch any big numbers about what it would mean globally if you know 
people did this on so many millions of acres? Oh yeah, we do that a lot and I refuse to show those numbers because <laughs> everybody likes to argue over numbers when the point is actually how you support people on the ground doing the practices that we know work. So I generally don't show the numbers. But I will say that if we did 5% of California rangelands every year with these practices, um, you, we would offset the emissions associated with the residential electricity sector in the state. Mm -hmm. So very high potential. When you start to look at it um, at a national scale and globally, which we're doing right now as part of an exercise with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab <coughs> and the IPCC, we think there's very, very strong potential to uh, manage um, Earth's temperature. I mean, I think it's important because we're constantly hearing about how hopeless everything is with yeah. regard to climate change, right. and to have you know if it, if it is something that can be a, make a substantial bite in the carbon in our carbon inventory, then you know it's worth people knowing that. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Even though I, I realize people argue over those numbers, and there's so many things in the black box that no one really sees, or right. few people see. Right. Well, I wish I had those other slides in here. There's. You know, the photosynthetic capacity of the planet is so huge that the difference between carbon emissions in the atmosphere in the summer uh, versus the winter are extreme. And you can look online, NOAA has this sweet little video where it shows a year in carbon emissions. And they go down so drastically in the spring in the northern hemisphere because all the plants leap out. So we think that there's enough potential that even <coughs> with, we have to stop emitting so much carbon. It's just like the end of the story, we have to do that. But we also have to deal with this lo load of carbon in the air. And we think with these types of practices, knowing what we now know about the soil, that we can actually reduce that level of atmospheric carbon enough that we could probably stabilize the climate if we can do this on enough land. Yeah. Um, so um, just the question of sourcing different uh, carbon inputs. Uh -huh. um, the ones that you had were on that's right. Um, is it feasible on this larger scale that you're talking about? All the inputs are going to be on the No. Like we're going to have a mix of yes. uh, just generic waste for lack of a better term. I mean, the reason why I put the thing about composting in there is we're really talking about a product that's gone through the composting process, the thermophilic process, um, because it's really important for health reasons and it's really important for water quality. Um, but the answer to your question is no. John Wick and Peggy have a certified organic ranch, so they needed to use certified organic compost okay. for that ranch. But what we're working with with the state right now and the USDA is not based on organic compost, but although range it's just, I mean, right now compost in the state sells to vineyards and orchards and high value buyers and landscapers and definitely not to range nature. <laughs> so we are gonna need a lot more compost from cheaper sources uh, in order to actually deploy this solution, which, as Chris is pointing out, is actually an incredibly powerful solution for climate change. Yeah. I just want to know, have you ever visited Sonoma Valley Worm Farm? Uh, I have not, but some of my colleagues have. Oh, great. Yeah, I was just, as a model for some of the composting of dairy, it's, uh -huh. it's pretty uh, forward changing. Oh, great. Thank uh, you. Uh, I'm just because I've done a lot of looking into compost stuff. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So, the, I mean, the reason why I put this up here is I feel like we need so we need to be capturing these materials wherever we can, and the more you can capture them closer to the site where they're from, or create compost, you know, on the sites where you're managing, kind of the better for the whole situation, because it keeps the biomass where it's being produced, and then it, you know, Im increases that productivity of that particular land. So. We're working with the University of California Extension Program on their master composting program and then trying to integrate that into as many other places as we can so that we can get more people knowing how to do good compost out in the landscapes that they're working on. And that compost is going to vary from worm composting to range composting to my compost bin in my backyard. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, another question. Um, so for, let's say, a, a, a rancher or a landowner uh -huh. to want to implement Mm -hmm. uh, can they apply for grants or something to help offset the cost or there be an additional cost for them? Yeah, so that's what I said earlier, which we're trying to do through the Governor's Healthy Soils Program, which is to make AB 32, which is the cap and trade program in California, the revenue from that funding to funnel towards carbon farming. The, what we're hoping is, and how it's being set up, is that 
a rangeland manager would talk to their RCD and they'd say, I want to do a carbon farm plan. And then they would have to do that plan, but then there would be money for implementing those practices, both from the federal NRCS and from the state of California. <coughs> well, it was in the 2015 budget for cap and trade funds, but that budget hasn't been passed yet by the legislature, so we're just waiting for them to pass it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course, sorry. So, uh, because there's some speculation on uh, urban landscape, mm -hmm. so let's say we are all creating a compost that's in our own part. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess speculation how we can do carbon sequencing in urban areas. Yeah. I mean, sure. <laughs> so I would, I mean, you could go online and look at this Comet tool, which is the, it's a really easy three-click tool. You pick your region, and then it tells you your soil type, and then you can pick from these different practices. And they don't all have to be rural practices. Um, we've recently found, and these numbers aren't in the tool yet, but that restoring small creek sides, like you're getting your riparian zone restoration, uh, and increases the soil carbon in a huge amount. So small, small sections of creeks being restored increase whole system carbon um, and the water holding capacity within that system. So anytime you have a small creek, getting that system right, um, things like you know hedgerows. Again, we want to avoid bare soil, and I know that you know bare soil is I can see it right there, um, but having so anywhere you can get plants or roots in the ground and you can keep those roots in as long as possible that increases your soil carbon capture so you can play with that tool and you can do I'm going to do a half a hectare of cover crop but that would just be for you changing an open field to something that's planted you know or an open space to something that's planted and you can see the carbon benefits associated with that a lot of these carbon benefits are associated up front, you have to remember that getting those organics, which San Francisco does so well, out of the landfill and into compost has a huge carbon benefit. So whenever you can capture green waste plus your whatever nitrogen base you're using, whether it's wet food or manure, and we have a whole program that looks at human waste, and getting that composted, you're having a huge carbon benefit. I think in urban systems, it's going to be replacing chemical fertilizers with compost. Um, and it's probably going to be, you know, getting more areas covered in grasses uh, and more small riparian systems restored. But again, I really look to you guys because you're the innovators, you're the stewards. I don't know this. I'm a policy wonk who's really fascinated with the soil and plants. So that's my presentation. Thank you guys.